Hey, hey folks, welcome back to Advent of Code in F-Sharp. We're almost there. We're almost hit the finish line. Day 24. Uh, this will be a recap, not a live coding session. And who boy, was it mathy this time. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've ever done this much math in the past 10 years. Uh, it's been uh, since my school days uh, to, to like prove, prove my statement. I have like... Uh, pages and pages of this stuff <laughs> uh, a lot of equations linear equations uh, solving a uh, sets of equations which is exactly what we're going to do in, in the recap uh, but i learned a lot uh, of new stuff i learned about a lot of new libraries even uh, which i wanted to share because uh, i'm super excited to dig into those <laughs> those look super cool uh, to solve uh, uh, problems like these so yeah let's take a look at day 24 it's the one with the hailstones. We were given a list of hailstones with a starting location and a starting vector, like a velocity vector. And we needed to figure stuff out for our sets of hailstones. For part one, we could disregard the Z components. So we were only working in two dimensional space. And we needed to find all the hailstones that intersected in a given, like, experimental window so we have like a, a window somewhere in our 2d space and we have all these hailstones shooting around and we needed to figure out uh, uh, how many hailstones actually intersected in uh, the given window and i used maths <laughs> i used maths to do this so uh, first i converted my uh, hailstones to linear equations and it took a little bit of noodling for me to figure that out, how that worked again. But if you know like X, Y, Z and D, X, D, Y, sorry, no Z, no Z is for part one. So if you know X and Y and D, X and D, Y, you can figure out uh, the more standard notation for linear equation, which is this thing, Y equals A, X plus B. So in this format, you need to figure out the values for A and B. Uh, B is basically what happens if X is zero, equals zero and A is basically the slope of your line. And the slope of your line, you can also write it as the dy over dx. And if you know A, you can figure out B easily for that formula, from that formula as well. So with a bit of multiplication, uh, division and subtraction, you can figure out A and B uh, given our xy and dx and dy. And if you have two of those lines, so two of those linear equations in this format, you can calculate the intersection which is, our, is the next thing I'm doing here. So say I have two lines, y equals ax plus b and y equals cx plus d, and I want to find the intersection. Uh, so I can just like equate the two right-hand sides, and if I solve for x, I can figure out uh, a formula for x, which is this division you see here. And if you have x, it's pretty easy to figure out y from that as well. So if we just fill in uh, our calculated x, in place of x here, we have like a formula that is with all like known a, b, d, c uh, components, so we can solve y as well, and we have found an intersection. Or at least if there exists an intersection. But that's basically what I did for part one. Linear equations and intersections of those things. So let's take a quick look at actually uh, how that looks like in code. It's all on GitHub if you want to play around with it uh, in more detail. Uh, but let's go over part one. So I have two-dimensional coordinates and I have two-dimensional lines which have an A and a B component. It's like this formula here, Y equals AX plus B. And then I have a function that calculates intersections just as we said. And there's like a little edge case. What happens if the two slopes are the same? What happens if the two lines are parallel? Well, then you don't have an intersection. So that's why I also use this option thing and have this guard clause in there. If my lines are parallel, no intersection. And otherwise we can do the solving for X and Y as we saw on my Moleskin notebook. And this is just parsing into those hailstones and this is converting our hailstones to two dimensional uh, linear equations, sorry, uh, which is also something you saw in the notebook. And if we have all the hailstone line equations and we can compare or calculate intersections, we just need to generate all combinations uh, of hailstones, which is just doing a double for loop and making sure you don't do the vice versa. Uh, you don't do A, B and then 
couple of iterations later, you do BA, so you don't have to do work twice, which is what I'm doing with this combinations function. And that is basically it, actually. Uh, we just parse all, all our hailstones, we just calculate intersections, and then we have this one more thing. <laughs> then we have this little thing, and then we count uh, how many of those intersections are actually in the box. Now, what is this one more thing? Uh, the example is actually pretty clear about it, and it says that uh, some paths cross in the past, some hailstones cross in the past, and I was stumped when I read that. What what does that mean, crossing in the past? But if you take a look at uh, what it actually means, uh, it means that uh, you apply. So you have your x y component and your velocity component, the x d y. Uh, in the past means that you apply your velocity. You apply negative velocity, so uh, you have x plus a certain amount of dx is like the, the resulting uh, x position. If that re a certain number of times is like negative because you applied velocity negatively, that's what they mean with in the past, and that's what I'm filtering out in this filter thing. So I'm comparing like the difference between uh, the current location and the initial location of the hailstone. And then I'm comparing that with the velocity component. And if those two have a different sign, so if that means that we applied our velocity negatively, uh, then we have a, like moved in the past. We don't need those. So we only need the ones where we moved uh, in the future where we have a positive sign. And that's what uh, I'm doing here. So I'm not really explaining it very well, but this entire filter thing is only filtering out uh, intersections that happen in the future and not when applying negative velocity and that's also why i needed to to pipe in my original hailstones next to my lines the lines were easy to calculate intersections for and the hailstones are easy to figure out this in the past thing and um, yeah that's it for part one actually uh, it was a painful flashback to uh my <laughs> secondary degree uh my, my time at school and then I thought, uh, ooh, that, that was painful. And I thought uh, it was painful, but fun. And then I read part two and it was painful and not fun <laughs> because I, I could not figure this out. Uh, quick recap for part two. What were we being asked to do? Hey, you know all those hailstones? Well, now figure out like one location and one uh, velocity vector, figure out one new uh, entry. And that's where you will be with a rock. And when you throw your rock, it will hit every hailstone. That's crazy. <laughs> so we needed to figure out a new line that would intersect with each and every of those 300 hailstone lines. And it was too much. My brain exploded. Uh, I did not know how to solve this. So uh, I noodled around with it for, uh, I think, an hour. Did not find a solution. And then I gave up and I went to the mega thread, the Reddit uh, containing solutions. And I saw a lot of people doing a lot of things. <laughs> I saw people using a... Uh, Theorem provers, I saw people using uh, linear algebra packages, and I saw people doing it by hand or with some uh, computation or some pretty straightforward computation. And I was thoroughly, thoroughly impressed. So I decided to do all three of those things. <laughs> and I'm going to now uh, do a quick recap of how, how I solved uh, part two using three different approaches, or let's say two and a half, because one of, is, one of them is doing something by hand, which you could do by using a package. Uh, but the three broad approaches uh, are using a theorem prover, uh, something like C3, and the other approach is using a linear algebra package, and the third approach is just doing the linear algebra yourself. So we'll, go, we'll be going over all three of those approaches. First approach is the most exotic one, the most heavyweight one, and the one that impressed me the most. Uh, I saw this solution first from a, a colleague of mine, actually. Shout out to Jeroen uh, for using Z3. <laughs> I learned about something new, uh, thanks to you. Uh, so yeah, uh, I used the theorem prover as a first stab at the problem. And the theorem prover I used is called Z3. Z3 is a theorem prover from Microsoft Research, blah, 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 blah. This, this is an empty statement this makes no sense <laughs> when i read it uh, but then i took a look at the examples and i was my mind was opened so what can a theorem prover do for us what what can this thing do for us uh, it's something like a, a constraint solver you you give this program uh 
a set of variables, a set of unknowns, and a set of constraints constraining uh, the possible values for those variables. And then this thing does its black magic. It's really crazy. And it gives you a solution like what are possible values for these variables. That was abstract. Let's make it concrete. Uh, this is the Z3FS. It's a F sharp wrapper around the Z3 library. But it's super dead. <laughs> this project, uh, I think, has not been committed on in five years. And it's using a version of C3 that's not even on Nugget anymore. So uh, when I ended up using this wrapper, I ended up rewriting this wrapper so it uh, was compatible with the latest version of C3. I'm going to submit a pull request uh, tomorrow, but uh, for now I just monkey patched it. And it's in my GitHub, but uh, I, I had to do open heart surgery on this wrapper. But uh, I digress. What is this Z3 thing? Uh, let's say uh, it's basically a, a solver for riddles. If you have the, like these riddles in, in, in the newspaper or something, uh, like uh, you have neighbors and you know certain things about neighbors now figure out who lives where stuff like that uh, Z3 is very good at solving that and this is a very concrete example at what you can do with Z3 and what that F sharp wrapper looks like So say we have three variables say we have a dog a cat and a mouse and they are integer variables So they can just be any number and we know stuff about these variables. We know that we want to have at least one dog. That's what you see in this rule here. And we want to have at least one cat, at least one mouse. And the sum of dogs, cats, and mouses must be exactly 100. So I want 100 animals. And I know something about the cost for an animal. I know a dog uh, costs $15, a cat costs $1, and a, mice costs, a mouse costs 25 cents and I have $100 and I have to spend it all. Now, uh, give me like a, a solution for this problem. And this is what C3 can do. You just give it variables, you just give it so, a set of rules or, or a set of uh, theorems, and it will figure out a solution if there is one for uh, this problem. And this is something we can use for part two, uh, because uh, we can actually specify a whole lot of rules. We have 300 hailstones worth of rules. And there, there's actually one uh, brilliant uh, uh, insight you can use uh, to generate thousands of these constraints uh, for Z3. And that is, what happens, what actually does it mean for a rock to intersect with a hailstone? Well, this is the essence. This, this formula see here, this is the essence. Uh, it's just for the X component, but it, it's the same for Y and Z. So it says that uh, given my original starting position and a certain amount of time applied, uh, applying uh, the velocity in that direction, uh, this, so this is the rock part that should intersect. So that should be exactly the same as the initial starting uh, point of my hailstone, applying the a vector in that direction so I, I used a and d uh, because i was getting confused but uh, so applying uh, the, the velocity vector exactly the same amount of times because uh, we want to look at the, the same moment in time those two have to intersect at one moment in time so this is an equation and uh, x and dx and i can do it the same for y and z but for, forgive me for my horrible writing, but I can write the same formulas for Y and Z. They look almost the same. They look very similar. Uh, I have like three equations here uh, for one hailstone. And if I just, uh, turns out I need three hailstones and the linear algebra uh, solutions, uh, which we'll go into later, will make clear why we actually need information about three hailstones. But uh, if, if I you generate these uh, equations or these uh, constraints for three hailstones so uh, my a and my d those are the hailstone components if i generate these uh, formulas or these equations for three different hailstones and give all of those constraints to z3 and just say solve it mate <laughs> z3 will actually solve it so let's take a look uh, this is the c3 uh, solve and it looks very similar to what we did for port one but this is where it gets interesting so let me, I'm going to play around with it in the REPL a bit to get a feel or to help you get a feel of what's, what's happening here. As you can see, I just uh, pull in the Z3 nuggets to import a library and I do a load of a local file, which is my monkey patched version of the Z3 or the FS Z3 wrapper. 
Uh, so this is a bit a bit more friendly for F Sharp, uh, a wrapper library. But as I said, it's a bit outdated. Uh, we need to patch that real quick. Uh, and you saw cat, mice, and dog a second ago. These are the six unknowns we are messing with. We want to know the X, Y, and Z location of the rock. And we are also interested in the velocities. We don't really want to know them, but we need to provide them as variables for Z3. So yeah, let's define these six variables for Z3. And then we are going to generate a lot of constraints. And these are exactly those functions as uh, I showed in my Miro board. This X plus T times DX. This is x plus t times dx. This is exactly those equations. And I'm equating the rock part with the hailstone part in x, y, and z dimensions. So this is literally, literally what we were discussing in the mirror part. And I'm just generating those constraints for a given hailstone. What is this n? I don't remember. Oh yeah, that's just to specify a different variable for the times. Because whenever... Uh, the rock intersects with a hailstone. The time might be different for every hailstone we hit. It might be we hit the first hailstone in the first nanosecond, but the second hailstone we might hit in at like the 21st uh, nanosecond. So I'm also generating a time uh, variable for every different hailstone. And then I just say, okay, give me a couple of hailstones, three, more on that later, and generate me all those constraints for those three hailstones and pull them all in one big constraint list by collecting them and then just giving all those constraints to Z3 and then just saying solve it. <laughs> That's just great. You can just specify all your problems, all the problems you have in the world and have like a library solve it for you. That's impressive. And then uh, Z3 returns hopefully a solution and it does in this case. Let's print out the solution and let's take a look at what we are getting in the REPL. And who boy, what the hell is this? <laughs> uh, it's returning a solution, and the solution is a list of symbols, function declarations, and results. Tuples. I don't even know what a function declaration is, I don't even care, but I see symbol in here, and I see results in here. And that's actually what we need. We don't care about T0. We care about X, Y, and Z, right? And as you can see, there's a lot of things in here. But for example, here, there, this is the DX component and it has a function declaration. I don't even know what it means, but it also has a value, which you can see here. It's a constant of 63. And for our X, Y and Z, there's also a solved constant in there. So right here, I'm just starting to, starting to dig into the results to extract my X, Y and Z values. Uh, and it took a bit of data mangling and extracting. And I'm not too proud of uh, all these green squiggly lines, but hey, it works. The F-sharp wrapper is not really super uh, uh, accessible to extract data. So that's uh, also we need to do something we need to do over there. <laughs> but it works and it gives you like solved values for the X, Y and Z variables. And then you can solve for part two. And as you can see, it's a very, very, very big number. Something you would not want to calculate by hand by brute forcing. Uh, but we don't have to because we have C3. So that's the first approach to solve part two. Just use a constraint solver or a theorem prover. Just, that's a good a good joke. <laughs> but you can use a theorem prover to solve part two. Uh, and that's the power tool. And there are more easy uh, approaches to do it, which is the beast called linear algebra. Let's take a look at how you solve this using linear algebra. We are trying to find six unknowns. X, Y, Z, DX, DY, DZ. We're not really interested in the latter three, but we really want to know the first three. But we need all six components uh, to solve this equation or to solve this set of equations. So we want to solve for six variables. What does that mean? We need six equations <laughs> containing these six uh, variables. So how do we go from what we have, our hailstones, to six equations? in six variables. Well, we start with the same formula again. This uh, x plus t dx equals a plus t d. That thing we can use to generate all the equations we want. Uh, so, for example, if we rewrite this formula to have t on one side, we end up with x minus y a 
over d minus dx. So it's a bit of a algebraic manipulation, and poof, we get there. And if we do the same for the y components, uh, we get this y minus b over e minus dy, same thing. And then we have like two divisions that are similar. We can just equate this thing to this thing. And if you want to uh, do stuff with equations, you can do like a product of x minus y times e minus dy and vice versa. So that's what you see here. And then you could just start calculating out all of those multiplications uh, and be a good little uh, linear algebra equation solver. And then you have all these terms, as you can see here. And then you can put these terms to the left and the other terms to the right. Why would I want to do that? Well, because these terms, the y times dx and the x times dy, those are not very fun. Those are products of two things, two uh, variables we're interested in. We want to know y, we want to know dx. I want to know x and I want to know dy. But if those are like smooshed together in one component, multiplying them, that's not really cool for solving linear equations. So I put all those on one side and all the rest on the other side. And the right hand side of this equation actually has nicer terms. So no uh, multiplying two terms with uh, unknowns what we're interested in, but like I want to know y and it's multiplied by d. So the, the coefficient d is not like mixed in with something we know. It's like a pure known value, something of a hailstone. So if I put everything I'm, that's hard to solve on the left hand side and everything that's easy to solve that has like a clean coefficient in the hailstone land and a clean uh, unknown in the rock land uh, then I have a big ass formula like this and then I see whoa everything to the left is like purely rock stuff and everything to the right is like uh, dependent on the hailstone well it's dependent on one hailstone and the thing on the left is irrelevant hailstone irrelevant this is like only rock data uh, if you uh, come to that conclusion you can take this right hand side and equate it for the same right hand side but for a different hailstone because that will have the same left hand side that's not hailstone dependent and if i uh, equate this thing to another hailstone's exact same like or writing it out and then if I start uh, putting all the y and the x and the y and the z and the dx and the dy and the dz components to, to each other I end up with a huge formula like this so then I end up with this of uh, this many times x plus this many times y and all those coefficients are in terms of hailstone data hailstone velocities hailstone locations stuff like that and this is doing it for x and y, so that ends up with a very long equation with six unknowns. The unknowns are x, y, z, dx, dy, dz, and like a right-hand side that contains no uh, x, y, z. So it's a purely a value. And I can do the same. So this was doing that whole equation thing for x and y. You can do the same whole equation thing for x and z, and you can do the same whole equation thing for y and z as well and then you have a set of three equations in six unknowns six variables we're halfway there <laughs> and this is using uh two hailstones so this is using a1 a2 e1 e2 so if we just use two different hailstones and use the same set of three equations we suddenly have six equations in six unknowns and that's something we can solve. So linear algebra to the max. Uh, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and this is what I did in this linear algebra file, which is doing uh, exactly what I was saying. So we have this huge, uh, these huge three linear equations expressing x, y, or having six unknowns or rock unknowns and it's all written in terms of two hailstones so a b c d e f which are the x y z and the velocity components and it gets a bit big but it works and uh you can and this is where i generate my equations so this is literally all those equations you see and i am generating some uh matrices i'm generating a matrix a and a matrix B. 
And that's because I'm using a library called mathnet.numerics. Let's take a look at that library. I'm using the F-sharp wrapper, but uh, it's not really important, I think. Yeah, maybe. No. Let's take a look at the documentation. Uh, what am I actually doing? I am solving a linear equation system. There we go. Oh boy. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this gets mathy, but uh, if you have what we have, if you have like a set of equations, in our example it's six equations with six unknowns, and you can write them in the form of this thing, which is exactly what we just did, or if you want like matrices, you can write it in, in a matrix style like this, which is exactly like we did, but instead of three uh, unknowns, we have six unknowns, x, y, z, dx, dy, dz. And Turns out, if you have your A matrix, your B vector, uh, you can solve for your X vector. And this uh, math.net package does that for us. So if I just give it my A matrix and my B vector, it can solve my X vector. Piece of cake. <laughs> Which is uh, what we're doing here. So I'm generating my A matrix, my B matrix, and that's for one set of two hailstones and I do that a second time because three uh, equations is not enough. You need at least six equations if you want to solve for six variables. Uh, and that's why I do this for uh, two sets of two uh, hailstones. And then I have uh, a couple of matrices and I smoosh those matrices together. I just append my three equations to the three next equations and I append my uh, B vectors as well. And then I can just do the thing in the, in the nuggets. I can just say, okay, now solve this uh, set of linear equations for me. And boom, it just works. <laughs> so this was actually a lot of writing. Or writing out those formulas took me an hour, I think. Uh, and all the typos I made, or all the, uh, the problems I made. But yeah, it works, and it gives the same big number. So yeah, that's cool. <laughs> but still, something was nagging. Uh, I, I did not really love the, this approach because I was using a Nougat package and I did not uh, you, uh, know about the existence of this Nougat package before I started looking for linear equation solvers in .NET. So yay uh, for learning something new. But I still felt like I want to I wanna know how to do this by hand. <laughs> I'm masochistic like that. Uh, uh, but it turns out if you have uh, like these linear equation problems, there's a lot of smart people, old, dead people. <laughs> There's a lot of people uh, that have actually uh, invented really interesting techniques to solve uh, linear equation sets like this uh, quite efficiently, which is what I'm going to do like as approach number two and a half, approach number three. Um, and this one is using uh, two... It's using the same matrices as we just saw. So it's using the same equations and the same A and B stuff. As you can see here, so this is exactly the same, but instead of using our, uh, what was it called, math.net uh, linear equation uh, nugget, I'm going to do it by hand. <laughs> and how you can do it by hand, uh, it's you can do it in a lot of ways. You can do it with something called Gaussian elimination that looked really complex, or not complex, but that looked like doing a lot of work. And there's this other thing called Kramer's rule, which I ended up uh, implementing. And Kramer's rule, if you take a look at this, it's stating that it's a formula for the solution of a system of linear equations with as many equations as unknowns. Hey, we have six equations with six unknowns. Give it to me, Kramer. Uh, and A times X equals B. That's exactly what we were doing. So, hey, this is interesting. Uh, and if you so want to solve uh, this system uh, with Kramer, uh, you have to do a lot of smooshing <laughs> and calculating determinants. And that was scary because it's been 13 years since I've had to calculate the determinants. But turns out it's pretty doable. So what's the, the main algorithm for Kramer's rule? It's uh, you can figure out the x, y, z if you figure out some determinants. And determinants are like a, a number of a matrix. We'll, we'll go into that uh, in just a second. Uh, but if you have like your matrix A and you calculate its determinant and you smoosh some values into the matrix A for every different component you want to solve for, you can figure out the values. Uh, and the interesting part is here, like so, if I want to calculate x0, which is my x uh, 
value, I need to find the determinant of a0 over the determinant of a. And what the hell is a0? Well, a0 is the matrix formed by replacing the zeroth column of a by the vector b. So I have to slice out a column in my matrix and shove in vector b. <laughs> and I have to do that for all three uh, unknowns I want to find for my x, y, and z. So uh, that's actually what I did. I did some smooshing and splicing. So I, I wrote a function to splice. And this is where Array2D, the F-sharp data structure, actually comes in really handy. If I just want to like remove a column and have a left hand and a right hand side, things to the left of that column and things to the right of that column, look at how elegant you can write this in F-sharp. It's like, okay, give me every row, but every column from zero to column minus one. I, I love that. <laughs> And the same for the right hand side, it's like, give me every row, but for columns, I want to start here and just give me everything that follows after that. It's so elegant. So yeah, that's splicing and my very scientific smoosh function just, <laughs> just takes uh, two uh, matrices and like pastes them together uh, vertically. So that's smooshing. That's my scientific smoosh function. And if I have a splice and a smoosh, I can do that AI thing. Uh, slicing out a column in my matrix and plugging in the B vector. I can do this using these splice and smoosh functions. Last thing we need is, what the hell is a determinant? Good question. I forgot about everything about determinants, but there's something called Laplace expansion, which is a somewhat straightforward way to calculate determinants. So, example, if I have a matrix B, I can figure out the determinant of this matrix recursively. I can make this matrix smaller and do some easy multiplications. Easy. Uh, but if I have a 3x3 three three matrix, for example, I can, for example, take the first row, which is what this example is doing, 1, 2, 3, and uh, start calculating the determinant. You see 1 here, 2, 3 here, and it's changing sides, so this is a positive 1 negative two, positive three. And these matrices, these submatrices you see here is like, if I have one, I want the sub matrix two by two, that's like every column uh, except the one where one is in. And for two, it's like, just get rid of this middle column and then I have four, six, seven, nine. And for three, it's four, five, seven, eight. So I want to remove the right most column. So this is splicing again. I can reuse my splice thing to calculate those smaller sub matrices. And once you end up with two by two matrices, now that I remembered, that's uh, you can calculate the determinant for a two by two matrix very easily by doing a, a cross product kind of thing. So yeah, if I use Laplace expansion, expansion sorry, to calculate determinants, and I use Kramer's rule to figure out X, Y, and Z, then you can solve this linear equation set by hand. So this is my determinant function, which is using the Laplace expansion, uh, which is a recursive function. And if we have a two by two matrix, it's just a dot product thingy. So it's the easy way to, uh, or the easy uh, dimension to solve a, a determinant or to calculate a determinant. And if we have a bigger uh, matrix, then we do the thing, the Wikipedia thing, told us to do we just take a random row or column and I ended up just picking the top row because that's easy and I love easy and then just calculating all those sub matrices by slicing out the correct column uh, which is what you see here and then I smoosh back again and then I calculate the plus and the minus thing uh, given uh, whether we're the first or the second element uh, in my row so it's a bit obtuse, but it works and it's very testable. So I just test drove the hell, the snot out of this thing uh, to calculate my determinants. And if you know your determinants, you can e very easily using Kramer's rule. I mean, look at this. If I know my A and my B matrix, uh, I can just calculate some determinants. I can just smoosh and splice some matrices. Uh, and I can do it by hand. And it's been 13 years since I had to do this. And I hope I will never have to do this again, except for Advent of Code stuff, because oh boy. But actually, uh, I had fun. 
so you can solve it by hand. You can solve it pretty elegantly by hand. I think maybe doing this literally by hand instead of having to figure out an algorithm for uh, Kramer's rule. <laughs> that might have been faster to do it by hand. But anyhow, uh, we got it by hand as well. Uh, quick sidebar, if you do the determinants in .NET like I did here, calculating the determinant of the big matrix A, that gives a, a number that is like bigger than a long, bigger than a, an N64. I was not ready for that. Uh, but for that, I had to dive into the big int. It's in the system.numerics thing, which is like a truly unbounded numeric type. And then you could calculate a determinant for a, a big matrix like that A matrix we have here. So yeah, fun fact, uh, I went to solve it by hand and yes, it works. And yes, I had to refresh up on a lot of linear algebra and I hit against some walls I was not expecting to hit. So yeah, this was, uh, I think, the most fun I had in any Advent of Code puzzle this year, but also the most pain. <laughs> so I hope uh, day 25 will be uh, a breeze after this because this was really intense. Uh, quick recap, uh, how did we solve part two? Using three approaches, we used the theorem prover constraint solver called Z3, and we used the linear algebra package, and then we just said, screw libraries uh, and let's do this by hand, and we used Kramer's rule and Laplace expansion to calculate determinants. And it was some pretty heavy, pretty intensive mathematics. And uh, I hope uh, that's the last of maths for this year. So yeah, um, I hope I did not uh, blow your head too hard uh, with all this uh, uh, abstract stuff. <laughs> it took me hours to figure this out. So uh, if it's still a bit fuzzy for you, don't worry. Dive into the code. Pick one of the approaches that works for you. Uh, Z3 is the easiest one, but by far the most black magic. And yeah, uh, if you have any questions, if you want me to dive into any of these uh, topics a bit more, please shout out in the comments below and I would gladly do so. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again uh, for the last, yeah, the last puzzle uh, of Advent of Code in F-Sharp. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.